Cash Flow Diary Podcast, episode 420. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Cash Flow Diary Podcast, the podcast that teaches you insider tips, tactics, and strategies for creating leverage streams of cash flow into your life. Learn from top performing entrepreneurs, business owners, investors, and thought leaders from across the globe as they share their secrets to success. Like what you learn on this and other Cash Flow Diary podcast episodes? Go to learninvestingnow.com and sign up to receive powerful tips and information that will help you succeed as an entrepreneur and investor. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, educator, speaker, author, and master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's Cash Flow Game, Jay Massey. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Cash Flow Diary Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Massey, and I'm glad that you're here today because here's the thing. When you are out there building your business, when you're first getting started, you're the new guy on the block. I mean, you could be in an industry where others have, you know, prevailed for a long, long time. And here you come, you know, with your brand new idea. And it can feel like a David versus Goliath type of situation. What's interesting is did you know that it's possible to compete and not just compete, but to do good and do well and actually still maintain great bottom lines while building amazing staff and making sure that your organization is built properly and most importantly, leading and living your values without selling out? Well, today's guest is totally going to help us with that. In fact, he's done some amazing things, including being the CEO for 14 years while practicing medicine as an intensive care pediatrician and competing against companies that were even 10 times as much as 100 times the size. That's impressive because he did so and was recognized by the White House and ratings organizations as being one of the premier companies in the space to be able to actually make that happen. I have with me today none other than Dr. Jeff Thompson and What's interesting is that although he's, you know, an accomplished uh, physician, he's an accomplished CEO, and he's built these teams and he's received tons of awards, he's also written a book, Lead True, Live Your Values, Build Your People, Inspire Your Community. But what I think is really fun is that he still makes time for things like soccer. Now, what I want you to do is that I want you to take some time to listen and to understand because when you are in the field of battle slash competition, also known as business, sometimes you want to know how you can do it and feel good about it. And I think that's exactly what you're going to learn today. So help me welcome Dr. Jeff Thompson. Jeff, you there? I'm here. Thanks, Jay. That was a nice introduction. I appreciate it uh, a a great deal. And I hope we can uh, have some fun and uh, teach a little bit and maybe inspire some folks to... uh, take on their big challenges today. Well, I, I think you you do that naturally. I mean, a, anyone who preaches a, a message of values-based leadership is, is going to come from that particular spot. So I, I don't think that's going to be a problem at all. But before we get too far in, this being your first time here, I got to ask you the same question I tend to ask everybody the first time that they're here. Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. All right. So I tend to look at today's entrepreneurs a lot like yesterday's superheroes, you know, Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, etc. Because I think entrepreneurs and superheroes have a ton of things in common. Chief among them is that as an entrepreneur, occasionally I can envision myself as, you know, flying around the city, saving people with our products and services. Even occasionally, yes, I wear a cape. Also, though, like a superhero, an entrepreneur has a beginning. So if you think about Spider-Man, for example, there was a time before he was Spider-Man where what happened is that he was just a kid going to school and then he took some photos and then one day in the lab he gets bit by a spider and now he discovers I've got this new ability and he has to choose am I going to use it for good or evil so my question to you is as follows when it comes down to you know before all before your book obviously Uh, Before being board certified, before all the patients, before Gunderson Health System, before everything that people know you for today, what we want to know is, who is Jeff Thompson? Well, that's a great uh, question. I I was was afraid you're going to ask what 
superhero I wanted to be. And <laughs> as a as a pediatrician, of course, I'd have to go to a cartoon character and probably end up being Mighty Mouse. But nice. But, um, <clears throat> but uh, I'm I'm a uh, you know I'm a I'm a father. Uh, I'm a husband of 38 years. A father of three amazing children. Um, I'm I've been a mediocre athlete, but a pretty good academic uh, sort for a long time. Hmm. I was always small, slow, and not particularly adept at any sport, which is very important <laughs> in high school, of course. Yeah. But I could do anybody's homework, and so that <laughs> that was my leg up. And I I. Um, in college, I flourished. I didn't have any money. I worked as a janitor at a hospital, uh, got a scholarship, and my goal was to get to medical school without debt because I knew I didn't have any money to go to – my family certainly didn't have any money to go to medical school. So I worked as a janitor, um, uh, And uh, but from the time I was little, I knew I wanted to be a doc and uh, take care of people. So I, I got to medical school and decided uh, being a pediatrician was the right thing for me. It was the right fit. I like families. I like children. Um, and, and then I became an intensive care doc. Along the way, I had plenty of opportunities uh, to to make choices and to lead either in a faith community, at uh, camps I worked at, uh, 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 in school. So I, 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 people have asked, how did you end up leading a billion-dollar system? <laughs> well, it doesn't happen overnight. <laughs> right. It happens, you know, there's um, – you know, saying it takes a village is kind of cliche now, but but when you look back, it takes a continuum of multiple people with their insights. Uh, for the people that get a chance to read the book, you'll see that one of the people that I got an inspiration from was a church secretary who couldn't spell very well, who didn't write good sentences. She couldn't really organize the thing very well and wasn't very, she actually wasn't very good secretary, hmm. but she held that church together she knew everyone. She knew when somebody needed help. She quietly would go about doing it. She was a fabulous values-based leader that got a lot done, um, but but she didn't have all the characteristics that most people talk about. Hmm. She was also my mom, and, and, <laughs> and so I'm a little biased. But, but there are all kinds of people in your businesses, in schools, in manufacturing that have the ability – to lead forward if we give them an opportunity to do that. So that's one of the keys in, in building a strong organization is to is to make sure we we make it so the staff can use their abilities and their insights to help us build forward. Got it, got it. Now, I want to back up a bit, though. I just want to make sure I heard right. something correctly. You said you were the janitor at a hospital. Is that correct? Yes, right. So I you went from cleaning it to running it. Well, it was a different hospital, of course, but uh, I was in I was in college, and I I know I had had all these lab courses and things. So sometimes I was so busy, and I couldn't really have regular hours. So they would they would mm. leave around this little twenty bed hospital little list and say, Jeff, please do this. And it was kind of like having you know twenty different wives. I mean, you you had all the honeydew <laughs> lists, and so so the lab would leave me a list, and the laundry would leave me a list, and the nurses would leave me a list. And when I could come in, I would work really hard and do these things. And, and there were two regular time janitors that I would work with as well. Um, but I but that's what I did all through college. Now, I think it's really, really impressive that you, you the goal was to go to med school without debt. Like, I think a lot of people heard that loud and clear. Like, how did he do that? <laughs> um, you know, I did crazy things like worked as a janitor, um, lived pretty uh, uh, cheaply. I, I did get a scholarship, which was very helpful um, um, from a group. And and for a lot of it, I lived at home um, to keep my expenses down and went to a college in my own community and then just did very, very well in school and wrote a good test so that a big university, University of Wisconsin, would uh, take me. Got it. Got it. Now, it, I, I've got to ask this question. What lessons would you say, because I often say that people, you know, when they're trying to build their business or figure out what customers they should serve, you, the, one of the easiest ways to do that is to start with yourself. I mean, serve someone who's like yourself and, and don't discount skills that you may have developed in other areas because they contribute. And this is very, very true, like with parents and mothers where they're like, I, I'm, I'm a mom. I don't know how to be a business person. I'm like, no, you know how to sell because you got your kids to go to bed on time. 
So right. <laughs> yeah. my question is, what skill sets would you say or, or character traits or what things do you think you developed uh, during the, the janitor in med school uh, with the goal of going to med school with no debt and, and all of those things? Uh, what character traits or skill sets do you think you developed there that helped you when you were, you know, leading the, these massive organizations? Well, I, th- I think uh, th- there are a, a number of translations, and I think uh, you're absolutely right uh, that uh, you these things build build from a core. So, like working in that small hospital, I had to work. I was responsible for the whole place in evenings and and nights, and so. I had to work with every single department. So um, you learn, again, that they're all important. I mean, if the CEO, when I was a CEO, if I didn't show up one day, the whole, the whole place ran well. But if all the laundry ladies don't show up, we are in massive trouble. If the guy that runs the boiler and the air conditioning doesn't show up, we are in giant trouble and we can't take care of our patients the right way. So, So I learned that Everyone's important. Everyone has their own story, and everyone brings a different set of skills to the table. And they aren't the same, but the key is how to put them together in a way that serves a, a bigger purpose. And so it was it was great to work at it at a very small level and see how important it was to touch everyone. So when I became the CEO of a 7,000 person organization, I didn't lose that. I still went to the laundry and met all those people. And I went to the kitchen and I went to the laboratories and I went to the regional clinics, shook their hand, looked them in the eye and say, do you have the right tools you need? Do you have everything you need? Is there a system thing that's getting in the way of you doing a great job? How, how can we do a better job uh, from your point of view, from your place? And, and many, much of that came from those early underpinnings of understanding that ev- everyone has has a role and an, and a and a story, and they'd have different education and experience than I did, but but they were still very important. Got it, got it. So let's take that concept and give it, uh, you know, fast forward it to today for a lot of the people that are listening when they're out there building, you know, their business and their enterprise and trying to grow their cash flow. Maybe they're you know trying to get to the seven figure, eight figure, nine figure mark, right. what have you. Right. Um, but they're doing so with a distributed workforce. I can't exactly go to, you know, the, the my customer service team, you know, because they're not down the hall. Um, how does one manage to still do because what you what you're saying is like, man, that sounds great. But how do I do that when, you know, maybe my customer service person is in a completely different time zone than me? Right. So that's that adds that adds to the complexity. You're absolutely right. But I think it's one of the very important reasons that you have to have structure around your organization. You say, well, I'm a small organization. I'm just starting to build. Do I really need a purpose or a vision statement or a value statement? You need it more, at least as much more as any of the large organizations. You need it because if you're distributed, if you're separated, as you're hiring people in, you need to, they need to know. What is the purpose of this organization? Why do we exist? Why, why do we come here every day? A paycheck, you know, some uh, famous guy in an organization that were dissolving on the East Coast said, uh, money is a weak glue. If, if all huh. people are coming for is a paycheck, that's, that's not how you're going to recruit the brightest and the best and keep them. So develop a purpose and a vision. Here's where I want to go. Be clear and unembarrassed about a set of values. Here's the values of the organization. We were we were very clear. We wrote them down. We put them on the wall. We gave them to everybody. We the, in, in the book, you'll read a story about a, a neurosurgeon. It's hard to recruit neurosurgeons to rural America. We, we had a group of <laughs> very strong, thoughtful, I mean, there's a shortage in general. And then to get him to come to a, a, a county that only has 125,000 people, they were all trained in big cities. Wow. Um, but we had a, a strong group and we had a young man who was very good. He had good outcomes. He called me up one day and he said, Jeff, I, I think I might be in trouble. What are you in trouble for? So well, I hollered at a security guard. So what'd you say to him? He said, I told him, uh, he had to stop putting a ticket on my car and I make more money in a week than he does in six months. And he had to get a job that's useful. Ooh, that was terrible. 
I, I was quiet for a little bit. He said, no, you're, you're not going to fire me, are you? And I said, well, that depends. It depends how you behave. You go apologize to that man. You send a letter to his supervisor and say you're not going to do it again. You commit to treating everyone with respect. Then you have a great career here. We'd love to have you. We'll help you get there. But if you don't believe everyone's important, and if you are unwilling to treat everyone with respect, then you might as well put a sign in your yard because you won't last here. Wow. Okay. I get it. I get it. Now, uh, I know as, as we we face the challenges of, like I said, the distributed workforce, the way technology tends to replace that in-person communication, these types of things, uh, there's something, though, what that I find unique. One, you, you have... You talk about leading from from you know values first, but often I, I know in the business community the idea of leading values first usually is to the detriment or sacrificing either morally or financially in some way shaping in some way shape or form. But you you're saying no, you can do good and do well at the same time. Could you expound upon that a little bit? Oh oh, absolutely. And I and I I think that's a piece of conventional wisdom when I teach people about innovation, one of the keys I use is, is to say you have to have a disciplined disregard for conventional wisdom. So that, that doesn't mean you don't throw out all the wisdom of the ages. You know, your, your, your grandma actually knew a lot of pretty smart things. Mm. Um, um, uh, the, the Chinese wisdoms, the wisdom that came down through, through um, uh, Judeo-Christian Muslim ethic over the years. I mean, there's a lot of great wisdoms there. But all things that people consider wisdom is not necessarily wisdom. And one of it is you can't do both. And actually, I believe now there are many early, mid, late career people who are really looking for a, a purpose and a vision. And that, that includes competing and living your values, not, not selling your soul. So in this case, did it cost us some money? It cost us some money short term. But long term, we were able to stabilize a group. We were able to make it clear across the organization that no matter what your title, how much money you made, how much dollars you put on the books, you still had to treat everyone with respect. That story went around, stayed around. It rose the whole level of behavior in the organization. So long term, we had a higher level of behavior, less fear, more people willing to innovate, challenge point out problems, it it results in not a short term win. Short term, yeah, it cost me cost some it cost some money. Long term, we saved enormously. And we have many other examples where that happened across the organization. Okay. Is it po but is it possible to actually quantify that in some way, shape or form? Like how does um, it show up? I mean because that's I mean that's my natural thought is like I hear it sounds great. It sounds like a beautiful environment, but right. When you're, you know, we're all beholden to some sort of bottom line somewhere, something. I, oh, sure. I, I get making the investment. I'm down for that. But I, I got to know that there's the return some at some point, even if it's 10 years down the line. How do I measure it? Hello there, entrepreneur. This is Jay Massey. I know that if you've ever gone over to the site, cashflowdiary.com, you may have asked yourself, where on earth do you get a domain name from? Especially as you are beginning to build your bigger, better, badder business, you need a web presence. You need the email address. You need a way for people to contact you electronically so that you can stop doing the at gmail.com game. Well, the good folks over at GoDaddy have definitely supplied us with every domain that we have ever used. So what I want you to do is I want you to go over to trygodaddy.com forward slash Cashflow Diary. Again, that's trygodaddy.com forward slash cashflow diary because it's a quick way for you to get set up to capture your domain name the exact way that you want it. They got easy search functions, and most importantly for you is that you'll be up and running today. As I said, once you get started, stay started. Don't let small little obstacles of how to get your own domain name going stop you. So, again, go to trygodaddy.com forward slash cashflow diary. And let's get back to the rest of the story. Well, we um, we we had a lower fee increase every year for 15 years in a row that I was the CEO. So every year our fee increase to the community was less than the year before, all through the economic downturn, all through that. During that time, we also went from a high cost provider to a lower cost, much lower cost provider. 
and we put up more savings in 15 years than the company had in the last hundred. So I would say that's good financial success. Despite that, despite that, I use finances as a tool, not as a goal. It's a tool. It's an important tool, a very important tool, but it's not the goal. The goal is to improve the health and well-being of the patients in the community. So we said, now, did I have targets? Oh, yeah. So I wanted to decrease our cost of doing things. I wanted to decrease the cost of our materials. I wanted to deliver care at higher quality and, and less of a burden to the employers in the community. Of course I did. But those were all, th- those, those were all secondary goals to the goals of improving the health and well-being of the community. And we included the financial well-being of the community to get there. Because of that, hmm. we had many partners business partners, manufacturers, education, all kinds of people showed up to say, let us help. We can help. We, we can help you be successful because they believed we're doing it for the good of the community. Here's a financial return one. So hard numbers. Mm-hmm. Conventional wisdom said it's jobs or the environment. It's the economy or the environment. It's your bottom line or the environment. You can't do both. Mm-hmm. We said, yep. Uh, we said that was Um, uh, that was conventional wisdom we didn't believe in. We believed we could do both. And in an eight-year period from 2008 to 14, we we went on a plan. We took 5% out of our savings. All all big health systems have to have savings. Took 5% of our savings, invested in conservation, energy infrastructure. And in that amount of time, we reduced our greenhouse gases 95% decreased our pollution 95% and made money. We lowered our cost of care and the return on those savings was 10 to 12% and the return on our regular savings portfolio was 5 to 6%. Hmm. We made twice the money on our savings. We improved our local economy because we're buying now 95% of our energy locally and and we dropped our greenhouse gas emissions 95%. We did well and we did well financially and we lived our values of taking care of the community. I see. I see. So in this case, I mean, something as simple as setting aside. So I, I'm thinking like, how could an entrepreneur, in, in, you know, implement something very similar? Like if they're using office space, maybe part of part of that budget is a very small part because it doesn't sound like it was a lot uh, a large part but a a part of it can just go to let's go to more energy efficient light bulbs or something over right. time oh you're right conservation so here's here's a good i cfos i stand in front of ceos and cfos off, often and they say really um environmental stuff i thought you were right when you said that i was like I, okay I said, but go I am, for it you're I talking. Am a healthcare organization <laughs> and this is all about health by the way um you know they're thousands of people that die of uh, air quality related pollution in this country every year. And there are more people in the world that die of air quality problems than HIV and malaria combined. Oh, wow. So it is a health issue, but start with conservation. I, you know, we're a big organization. We have lots of square feet. I spent one, I spent $2 million in our first two years of this program. $2 $2 million on conservation, light bulbs, as you mentioned, pumps, motors, heaters, all kinds of things that we could change, conservation issues. And we saved a million two every year thereafter. Wow. That's, uh, there's probably not investments you can make 60 plus percent um, well, every you- year. Yeah, you're playing with house money at this point. I mean, because it, yeah. it, it's a, it's one of those things. It's like the thing that gift that keeps on giving. That's what, okay. So I get that. Um, now, in, in that situation, though, I mean, I'm just going to, I don't know how else to say it. You had to have encountered some resistance. I mean, I get the fact that you believed it, <laughs> <laughs> but you, how, do you, how do you get? Well, you are so right. You're exactly right. And there's a lot of people listening right now. They're scratching their heads saying, oh, come on. Another long-haired, sandal-wearing guy that uh, somehow got made in charge of an organization. Right. But, but remember, um, uh, this is disciplined disregard for conventional wisdom. This isn't just going out and buying a bunch of 
wind turbines and saying, look at this, I'm cool, I bought wind turbines. <laughs> this is careful measurement of exactly how much energy and exactly how much pollution we're causing and, and what the impact that might be and figuring out what are the investments we can make to mitigate all those things. So this is a disciplined um, uh, approach. And there were many skeptics along the way, but it's hard to argue with a 60 plus percent return every year. And so since we had that money, as you point out, I know we had some house money, then we're able to invest in some energy generation activity. Now, frankly, our numbers would look twice as good if the cost of natural gas would have kept going up like it had all through the, the 90s and the early 2000s. The only reason these numbers don't look even more fabulous is the fact that the natural gas glut dropped the price and and broke that curve of natural gas costs. We still made money compared to using natural gas, and we decreased the amount of coal-fired electricity that we used by 95%. So that that is a real uh, coup to improving the health and lowering our cost. Indeed, indeed. And I and I like this because it all stems from, like you said, a, a value first in, in getting everyone on on board with the mission. So as you know, entrepreneurs today are, are faced with this, I, I guess then you as far as you're concerned, there's we we don't we should we don't have to make that sacrifice is, is what I really hear you saying, because I think about when I go to do like a, a rehab, for example, or if we're rehabbing an apartment building, yes, right, hundreds right. of units, because my operations people always come to me saying, hey, we want to use, you know, this for lower emissions on that. And I'm just like, how much is it? Because there's always that it, what feels like this tug of, well, this would be great for the environment, but th- it now means you lose money versus, you know, but what I hear you saying is that if we're going to make these types of decisions, it's it's for the long term play. You can't have the immediate, you know, immediate term expectation of it's going to produce something in, in the short little while. Well, while you were talking, I wrote down uh, short term thinking. It, it is. I think <laughs> I, I, I think it's one of the big problems that we have in this country is yeah. is okay. so many people are so driven by the next monthly report and the next uh, quarterly report and and those kinds of things and we can make huge gains for our communities if we can think just a little bit longer and and I'm not saying undisciplined when I when I talk about living your values I talk about courage discipline and durability I, I don't I don't say live your values and hope it works out I'm saying <laughs> stand up for your values and then get your act together and really follow it. So here's 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 a move we made. Yeah. Um, to 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 the community. So the community is not that big. 125,000 in the whole no. in the whole county. So that's not very big. We had a high tech company that came in. It was built by a a, uh, a former um, um, Marine Corps uh, person who 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 didn't want to go to college. Wanted to build companies. He built this company to help take care of um, military people before and after deployment. And he was doing it much cheaper than the government was doing. So his company grew from a million to three million. Now he's a five million dollar company. He got some outside investors to put some money in, and now it grew. And now now is pro- approaching eighty, ninety million dollars. And the investor says, "Okay, good job. We said five years and out. We're out." Well, he didn't Whoa. have the money to buy them out. Yeah. And and they he looked around for buyers, and they're all going to move it out of town. Well, this company was growing fast. It had gone from a, a few jobs up to now five or six, seven hundred. Um, he had, he and his wife were major philanthropists in town. Uh, they were at, built a restaurant. It was really changing the waterfront where the Mississippi River comes through. It was really a significant uh, 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 contributor to the org, to the community. And and they might have to leave. Yeah. So after exploring all local options, they came to us, a healthcare organization, and said, "You have some savings." Would you be willing to help us get through this period? Mm. Get through this period and keep the company in town. I said, "Well, we're a healthcare organization. We have savings, but you know, they're to protect our bond rating and all those things." 
Uh, he said, but we're going to have to move out of town, and that's not going to be good for the well-being of the community. So we didn't just say, okay, here's a check for tens of millions of dollars. We had we had, we had, had our own board. We had uh, internal people. We had our uh, outside consultants. We looked really, really hard, and we ended up taking 25% of the savings that Gunderson had, had put together over 100 years. Wow. We took 25% of that savings. And we invested it in this company to keep it in town. It wasn't a, a guess. It was a thoughtful investment to say, this is good for the community. Hopefully, it'll be good for Gunderson uh, long term. But this, this, the, the greater good is serving the community here. Wow. We did. Now, we only had to hold it for 16 months. We found another buyer that was willing to uh, buy it. And um, the community did well. That buyer promised to keep it in town and grow it to 2,000 jobs, which they have done now. Um, and and the community has thrived because of that. The organization did well. Our investment did better than it had it lay, stayed in the stock and bond market. Right. And the community saw us as a servant of the community. Did we do well financially? Yeah, yeah we did uh, embarrassingly well. Um, but we served the well-being of the community and the courage it took to do that was recognized by the community and we have done very well ever since so okay here's the challenge that i think you're bringing i mean i'm, I'm sure those listening and myself included as we're listening to you we're going man how can i be like that today you know and in today's environment what can my business do how can we position ourselves to to do those types of things because I, I think at the heart every entrepreneur wants to do things like what you're describing i mean that's difference making for generations and and all of these other things um and how does let's let's say for example you were talking to someone getting started today how how do they What's their first step? Like, what are they? Gonna, I mean, this is just mind blowing to me right now as right. I'm listening. To so, you. so I think I think the first step um, is is uh, not size related. So, okay. so you don't have to be a big giant organization sitting on a pile of cash. You can do this with small, medium, and large organizations. Okay. I think it's first to be really clear about what your purpose is. What do you want to accomplish in? In 10 years and 20 years, you want to look back. What are you going to tell your grandchildren you accomplished? Hmm. You have to be very clear about your values. You have to say, here's what we're going to value. And, you know, you can talk to your employees. You can talk to other people in your space. Th th these are not secret things. You're going to put them on the walls. This is not a strategic. The value statement is not strategic. Hmm. What is strategic is how you live them because people will change jobs because of the values that are exemplified, not on the wall, but in day-to-day -day practice. Mm. So do you think the security people, all the security people know what happened with that neurosurgeon I talked about? Oh, yeah. You bet they do. Not only the security people, but everybody in the laundry and everybody uh, across the organization that they come in contact with know exactly what happened and whether that person's in the organization anymore. So I think you start with your values, and then, and then you look for partners. Um, if you have partners, your partners don't have to have the same culture as you do. If they have the same goal, improve the health and well-being of the community, and if they have similar values, you can work with them. If it's a different culture, that's okay. But if the values are off, then it's going to be messy. And if the goals are off, well, then you're going to both be in a different direction. So common values, common goals, and now you can start finding partners. You can say, here's our intention to accomplish these things. We don't have all the resources yet. We don't have all the assets. We don't, we're looking for other partners with the same values. You will find plenty of partners. We found many, many partners that were willing to work. With us. Okay, okay, but there's one thing, okay, because I was, one of the concerns when you bring in someone external though, is you know like like the other business face that they face this financial pressure because when you bring in investors they've got hey now it's suddenly what was we've got this eight-year vision to achieve this goal becomes all right the what, what what do the numbers look like this quarter 
And yes. so how do you balance that? Well, that is a constant pressure. And, and, uh, we, you know, I, I, we, we have, um, debt. And so the rating agencies come in and look through all our, our activities and they stare me in the face and say, yes, your quality is great, Dr. Thompson. And it was uh, fabulous how you serve the community. And it's great that you're, you're, uh, have this education program, but, mm. <laughs> and then they would turn the page and they wanted to see the numbers. Um, it was always, I want to see the numbers. And that ultimately for them had to win the day. But my contention is, is you can, you can hit the numbers and serve this higher purpose that the numbers turn out to be a tool for you to accomplish these greater things. And, and you can't ignore them. And it's not like I didn't know what was going on. It's not like I didn't know when the financial crisis was hitting that, that we and everybody else were getting mm. pounded. I knew all that. And I, I knew exactly uh, where that was going. But I didn't, I didn't for a minute believe that that, that was going to be our prime goal is just to survive. So, so when the senior team came to me and said, Jeff, I know you've been against layoffs forever. Mm-hmm. That, that just is not something you ever wanted to do. And, and you know these people and you love them and you, you want to take care of them. But, but I think now we have to start laying people off. I said, well, you know, I, I, I never promised we'd never have layoffs. But when I look around this room here, I'm saying, all you senior people, Boy, you cost me a lot more than anybody in the front row does. So I think if we're going to have layoffs, we'll start at the senior table. Because I think having layoffs in a large healthcare organization is probably a failure of management. So I think we'll start there. Turns out they came up with a lot of other ideas. <laughs> they, they, they were, they, they, that really got their brains thinking. And and we, we I never promised our staff that I, I wouldn't have layoffs. But... But I said, we're going to do everything we can. And I think part of it is to say, who, who's going to take the beating? Who takes the beating? So are you going to fire the people in the front row? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, are you, are you going to uh, get rid of the last 30 people that came in or the last 100 um, in our organization uh, or in healthcare, Sometimes uh, many people would say, well, we're going to get rid of behavioral health, no psychiatric services as if they're going to go away if you get rid of that. I mean, what are you, what are you thinking? Or they get rid of all the education programs. Well, that's, that's your future. These, these young women and men, they, I, you know, our job is to help bring them up so they can do a better job than we are in the future. That's part of our responsibility. So, so we, we made a, uh, a pretty serious effort to not jeopardize something that would hurt us for the long term to just have a short term. And so the person that took the beating was me. I went to the boardroom and I said, I know our plan set a 3% operating margin. This year it's going to be zero. It's going to be zero. I'm unwilling to, I'm doing 50 things to defend the organization's uh, stability, but I'm not going to cut it to the point to just get some numbers up. And Mm. so I took the beating and they, complained to me and they said you're gonna have to get it up and they said uh, you know we might need outside people to get a plan and you know a bunch of veiled threats but the point was I wasn't gonna hurt the staff so when I stepped down when I stepped down seven years later the organization had recovered we're doing well seven years later I'm stepping down they having we had a big ice cream social and 1500 staff showed up to say thanks um, they would pull me aside and say, let me tell you, Doc, when, uh, when things are going bad, we knew you had our back mm-hmm. and it made a big difference. And we all know that. Well, these are people who work in the middle of the night when you can't be around as their leader and boss. They make those decisions uh, frequently and, and uh, without uh, you having any say, if you set that kind of model, it it develops a tone. And I would argue that the smaller the organization, the easier it is to set that tone, Hmm. to get your arms around that and be clear that, that, uh, you're in it together. And then at the first whiff of a problem, uh, you don't, uh, 
delete them and their family. Yeah. Now, I, this is not easy. I, I'm not implying it's easy. It was it was not easy at all. But but those kind of decisions get noticed and and they don't forget. Wow. Wow. Um here's what I know is that I know that there's a number of people who have listened this far and they're they're probably just as impressed as I am because uh, you're you're talking a whole level of leadership that we all aspire to that probably would have inspired you to write the book in the first place which totally makes sense um and there's probably a number of them that actually want to you know find out more about what you have going on what's going to be the best way for them to to find out more about where what you're doing what you're up to and maybe even grab a copy of the book probably the best way is to go to my website my website is is jeffthompsonmd.com so it's pretty simple um it's all small cap small letters no caps and so it's jeffthompsonmd.com and if you you go to that site uh, of course you can get a link to the book and you can get a free chapter of the book to see if it's something you might be interested in but there's going to be many other publications links to other publications there so if you want to look around and read about other things i've written um uh, recently, uh, uh, a post on Forbes was in there and a post about the book in Huffington Post and there's a variety of things in there that you could learn from. That would be that would be a good place uh, to check out and learn. Excellent. Excellent. Now, uh, as we wind down here, I've got a question for you because I'm curious to hear your answer. Let's pretend for a moment that someone listening is ready to start their entrepreneurial journey. Uh, they they want to get started. They have dreams of building it big. They're ready to go to that next level. And as often happens when we make decisions like that, you know, we're we're we have a companion, and that companion often comes in the form of a voice, and it reminds us of what we're not and how it's not going to work. And there's no way this idea is going to actually happen. And for some people, they're related to that voice. <laughs> yes. So my question to you is as follows: Let's pretend this time. They're actually going to follow through. They're going to do what you suggest. And they're going to do so in the next 24 to 48 hours. What would you suggest that they do? Um, I, I would suggest uh, that uh, what they would do is, is sit down, sit down and write out uh, a, a, a purpose statement, why, why their company exists, um, a vision of what they really want to accomplish what would what would really make a difference in them accomplishing it? and then a set of at least four and no more than six values that they're going to live by so if they sat down and wrote that out n- n- no no big long treatise here just sit down and write those out you write those values out and then and then that will give you a baseline and then if you want to turn to your staff if you turn to your staff you need help so you need help so you, the next thing you do is on one piece of paper, now your second piece of paper, the second piece of paper you write down, here's what I and my company will deliver to my staff. You know, fair compensation, treat everybody with respect, opportunities for growth, those kinds of things. Um, and, then, and then what the staff will deliver to the organization. That's not unfair. You can ask them. Just be clear. Great people want to know where the fences are and then just let them run within the fences. So treating with everyone with respect, leading on, on, on service if you're a service type organization, leading on innovation if you're a manufacturing type organization. Build, build a clarity on those two things. If you had clarity on those two things and then you start sitting down with your leadership, your staff in, in small groups so you can get feedback and and your advisors, the group of people that advise you, now you'd start getting clear feedback on how to get from where you're at to where you're going to go. So I would say you could do those things in the next 24 to 48 hours. You could write those things down, and it would provide a baseline for the long term. And if you want to see what we did, I'd be happy to send you those uh, from my website. There's, there's a way to send in questions. Uh, it's certainly in the book. It's in the things I publish. Um, uh, one page strategic plans, uh, one page uh, compacts on how to behave. Nice. Love it. I love it a lot. I, I definitely appreciate 
the experience that you've laid here. I, I even appreciate the fact that you, you just started at the Jenner. You've got a great work ethic all the way through. Um, th- those are things that, you know, at the end, when it's all said and done, we all hope to be able to say things that this is what this is the impact uh, that I was able to produce based upon the service I rendered to my local community. I definitely appreciate your knowledge, your insight, and the wisdom that you shared with us here today, sir, at the Cashflow Diary. Well, thanks, Jay. It's been uh, good fun talking with you. I hope we helped um, some of the people listening. And uh, if they go to the website, they have questions. They, there's a place there you can send questions to me. I, I respond to everyone's questions. I'm happy to do that. Uh, I like uh, helping people move along. It's it's not easy. It's not easy. I never said it was easy. Um, I, it's actually hard but it's it's pretty straightforward how to get there. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you know what time it is. It's time for you to move at the speed of instruction. What does that mean? That means, well, jeffthompsonmd.com. Go. You've heard it straight here. I mean, like every word he was saying, you could hear the passion, the values that are all right there, and you now have a template that you can go grab to begin to be exactly that same way. I think one of the best things to understand is that money is a weak glue. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been fun talking to you today. I look forward to talking to you soon. Until next time. <laughs>